Time for another chat with uh, State Representative Tacky Chan of Quincy for a Tacky Talk. How are you, Tacky? Doing good, Joe. Good to see you on this bright and sunny Wednesday. It's awesome. Let's keep this uh, warm weather going. It's not even Indian summer yet because we haven't had a frost yet, so we have that to look forward to, too. Well, it's uh, after this wet summer and this uh, roller coaster September, it'd be nice to have a little bit of consistent weather. And uh, leaf peeping apparently is going to be a little late because of uh, the warmer uh, fall and the wetter fall. Uh, but I mean, you know, it's a nice day to have a chat, even though we're still uh, in this two dimensional world. I know. It's, it's, but not only us, it's uh, as we talked about many times, it's not going away. There's going to be hybrid communications, I think, uh, for, for, for the future. Agreed. I mean, even uh, we returned some, some degree of normality back into office spaces. Uh, you know, this, this type of work does have its advantages. Uh, particularly uh, people who have limited mobility, people who travel outside the state, um, doing this weekly podcast, for example, with you, um, it creates a, a new type of convenience. And uh, although I discovered one of the challenges through this past year and a half is time, because now you can back to back to back to back, so to speak, much more easily. And, uh, you know, you got to get a gap in there to, to get a drink, a bite in the bathroom, you know, just saying. Yeah, you definitely have to uh, set some uh, boundaries or, uh, for yourself because they won't be set for you. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's something I discovered, you know, more than once. And like you're just rolling back to back. I mean, I, I need like a few minutes here, people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just a little water cooler time, as they say. Exactly. <laughs> or bathroom time. Just let me get to the bathroom quick. Yeah. <laughs> What's uh, happening in, in uh, your world these days? Uh, we're getting for another debate tomorrow. It's Thursday. Uh, the redistricting bill is up. Um, we like to get this thing onto the governor's desk uh, as soon as possible in case he has amendments or vetoes uh, before November 8th, which is the day that people have to live in district to run for their seats. Um, so that's pretty important. Historically speaking, uh, the House and Senate does not amend each other's districts in their branches. So uh, generally speaking, so uh, any amendments that we may see coming up uh, tomorrow will be only on the House side regarding House membership issues. Um, this informal session is 11 o'clock today. Right now it's about 11, 18 ish. So informal session is still going on. Uh, we're waiting to see if there's actually rules regarding how to file amendments or not. I, I don't know yet. Um, they'll, they'll issue an email probably by noontime instructing us on if there's going to be amendments on, and how we have to file these amendments for tomorrow's debate. Um, so I'm sure. Uh, uh, that a lot of communities are asking about, you know, why their rep or set of districts set up the way they are. A lot of our colleagues are now talking to their local officials, trying to explain to them uh, how come the lines have changed for the rep, why they got a new rep, a new senator, as well as the communities got split. One, one of the notables one is like Haverhill, for example, the Senate district uh, cut Haverhill for the first time and unified Lawrence as a single community for the purpose of their district. Um, and that's, that's a new occurrence, uh, splitting a city the size of Haverhill. Mm. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, maps, obviously 200 maps. I, I will be honest, I had a chance to review all 200 because they released a new set of maps Tuesday evening. No. So, <laughs> it okay. is Monday morning. I've not had a chance to try to, you know, look at all these maps to see uh, what's going on and what's happening. But again, yeah. there's, priority to create minority majority districts and uh, they released yesterday a new map uh, changing the Brockton uh, district to become more minority majority. Okay so any changes for Quincy that you know of? No uh, Quincy will pretty much how I described in the past you know I will uh, take another precinct in Quincy uh, up in me from 13 to 14 precincts. Uh, Bruce Ayers will uh, get back the Dan Hunt precinct so Dan Hunt is no longer be part of the delegation pushing them back over the Deposit, And uh, Bill Driscoll, uh, Milton, and Bruce are now going to have minority majority districts because of Randolph. Oh, they split so, Randolph. Okay. Yep. They split Randolph. And Mark Hughes, the brain trap, is out of Randolph and instead takes a precinct from Holbrook. And uh, our good speaker uh, loses a precinct from Holbrook and he stays within the margin of error. Okay. So minor shifting around going on locally, at least. Yeah, but I mean, I warn all folks that uh, since the city changed the precinct lines, your voting locations may have changed and your counselor and your rep may have changed. The senator obviously won't change. Right. But I mean, you may uh, realize that uh, because you're just across the street or, um, you know, a bit of expansion here and there, please be very aware that starting next year, your polling location uh, may have changed. 
uh, and also um, your counselor or rep may have changed. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that you called me in the past. I'm going to turn you down. My office is a very open policy about you know at least taking everybody's calls and figure out you know what to do next. Yep. 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 The city clerk, I know, will do a major uh, public notification probably later next year. And if we continue, continue mail-in voting, it alleviates a lot of the issues associated with polling locations. Yep. It, it's got a very positive reception from, from many residents uh, who uh, want to vote early or unable to be here on election day, or just the confusion and challenges of getting to polls, particularly if you're um, have some limited mobility. Yeah, it's a little concerning though with uh, some changes in the first class mail uh, on the on the U.S. Postal Service side, at least. Agreed. I mean, one of the things though, for example, could be helpful is in senior housing complexes. You could give it to um, to the people that work there, and you know, as long as it's sealed, you can have them drop it at City Hall on your right. behalf, for example, in bulk. Uh, you know, you always can do things like that. But I mean, you know, there are. Uh, the mail service, like last time, you know, had prioritized anything that had a mail-in ballot envelope uh, for for movement. So I don't know what's going to happen next election cycle, mm. um, but you know, we'll we'll play as it comes. Senator Keenan actually has a very interesting change too. His current district is Quincy, uh, the west side of Braintree, Holbrook, Abington, Rockland. He's uh, because of the shift in the Brockton uh, demographic uh, to the minority majority, it shifts everyone around him. So he's actually going to be uh, Quincy, the east side of Braintree, which is about three, I think, three precincts uh, oh. on the way to Holbrook, Rockland, and Hanover. Oh, that's new for him. Okay. Yeah, that, that's going to be very new for him. So he's becoming a squiggly line. So mm. um, generally, you know, one would think. The logic of redistricting keeps communities, surrounding communities close together. But this is redistricting, and it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody gets to keep um, communities that are adjacent to the community they're in. Now we have squiggy lines all over the place. I'm not seeing the congressional map, map yet. Okay. okay. Uh, but then, there is no residency requirement for Congress, by the way. You can move into a district anytime you want. There's oh, no interesting. Time. Okay. There's no, time, there's no time restriction. Okay. And I think Massachusetts is retaining all its congressional seats, is it not? We are. Yeah. There are nine. We do not have to squeeze anybody out. Yeah. So stay tuned for future changes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't see uh, why well, I think all the reps, uh, I think all the congressmen have to grow, uh, grow geographically because of shifting population. Right. We don't see Steve Lynch seeing a major shift with the possibility of him having to pick up some more towns going south. And uh, some questions, uh, smaller towns, like so, and possibility of how much they shave out of Boston because of Ianna Presley growing as a minority majority congressman. Yeah, which yeah. probably looks like a lollipop because of the way they got it to Randolph. Oh, interesting. Well, I mean, as a, someone was asking me the other day, what do I think of uh, redistricting? I mean, it's like tomato, tomato. It depends on. Uh, which side of the fence you're on regarding conversation or whether or not you want contiguous communities in a, in a, in a district, or do you want to create uh, certain types of districts uh, that satisfies um, different interest groups? Mm. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it would seem to me to make it more equitable, you know, you just base it on population. Well, logic dictates that you should try to keep, you know, uh, adjacent communities with a district. And I know there's a problem with our population because we have to meet certain population requirements. So it does create some odd looking places sometimes. However, you know, that would make some sense. But I mean, you look around the maps, particularly the Senate maps, you know, it's interesting, let's say at least about how they move these squiggly lines. Mm. Hmm. And these, these won't change now again for what, another 10 years? Yep, we're locked in for 10 years unless we get sued. Uh, for a, um, for lack of a term, gerrymandering situation to disenfranchise a certain people. And uh, the goal of redistricting is to prevent those lawsuits from happening. Yeah. It's, it's tough too with, I mean, at least on the coast, um, you know, you're limited by your districts by the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> you, know, you can't just draw uh, four by four squares. It's like you know, could, couldn't Colorado or Wyoming, I suppose. Oh, well, you're right. I mean, the, the uh, border communities as well as uh, the coastlines, and not all our borders are straight lines. Uh, everyone knows that little weird dot by Springfield. Yeah. Um, you know, just, they're not exactly straight lines all through the whole thing. But, you know, the idea is that you want to, you know, get as close again to the population number as, as 
you know, we can. So yeah, when you're budding um, a border or an ocean, uh, there's really nowhere to go. I mean, there's not, <laughs> it's not like I have a lot of options, which is like, everyone asked me how to resisting work out for you. I'm like, I'm a budding an ocean speaker and Bruce on the other side. It's not like I have a lot of places to go. Right. Uh, yeah. It is actually, you could get, you could get me out of Quincy, but it involves a lot of maneuvering around or I have to like get places via ocean. If you can see it by land to another piece of land, that's considered okay. So like, for example, I could get a piece of Weymouth, not like the water piece of Weymouth, but you know, I could get a piece of Weymouth via Hull's Neck. Okay, sure. So I can see Hull. Yep. Technically speaking. <laughs> technically speaking. On a clear day, yeah. <laughs> a clear day. Uh, but I mean, obviously that's not something we're looking to do in terms of maintaining continuity uh, of uh of uh, adjacent communities. So, uh, you know, for example, for me to get to Braintree, you know, I would, aware enough, I would have to like squeeze my way all the way down to Willard Street, you know, to Shays Rink, mm-hmm. and pop there, but then that cuts off Bruce from getting to Weymouth. Mm-hmm. I mean, to Weymouth, getting to Randolph. Right, right. For me to go to Weymouth, I have to cut through Quincy Point. And then that, that you know, that pushes Ron, you know, going, you know, west because he follows the town brook going westbound and to on the Weymouth side to get to home. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like a domino domino game. Yeah. Any representative looking to make changes to the district needs to have neighboring reps and senators essentially play ball together to try to figure out to keep the math in place while trying to move uh, precincts around that they that would satisfy their interests. Right, right. It's a lot harder than it sounds. You need yeah. to put a lot of time in. I want to ask you, Techie, what do you think about it? The governor um, reached out to the mayor of Boston to offer some help with Mass and Cass. I don't know what the state can do there. What do you think about that? Well, Mass and Cass has got a lot of news, despite the fact it's been there. This is not a new problem. I think this is kind of, again, you know, we don't pay attention to things we don't want to look at, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm familiar with that feeling. Uh, so, uh, there is clearly a problem on Mass and Cass in Boston. That's a reflection of the fact the city has just not really gone in deep with resources uh, to address the issue. And, and the city does have resources. Boston's a $3 billion plus budget. So the state throwing a lot of this stuff, you know, again, it's providing service, support service from existing agencies, whether it be housing, substance abuse issues, um, you know, mental health assistance, uh, access to Medicare, um, access to uh, food, food insecurity, um, things like that. Uh, but it, you know, clearly there needs to be a, a real evaluation of you know, what's going on there, and you know, what are the uh, what are the things that people need. I mean, I think people uh, give a lot of negative stereotypes uh, towards things uh, of this nature and and the people involved. And uh, you know, you really need to find out you know what's going on with people individually to see what happens. Uh, one of the consequences of Long Island uh, mm-hmm. shutting down is that the city of Boston back under Mayor Menino really knew this was going to happen and they didn't make preparations for it. And the uh, city of Boston has plenty of space uh, for more services. They just choose not to. Mm. Uh, as I was being uh, snippy uh, to one of the Boston folks the back many years ago now, uh, it feels like, about Long Island, they were like, you know, it's great to bring Long Island back online. And like, you know, I was like, don't you have a lot of space in the waterfront that you could use for human services? Mm-hmm. And you walked away from it. Oh, interesting. Okay. And, uh, there is space in Boston. It's They choose not to use it. That's just the bottom line. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, the old Shattuck Shelter, I think, is available. That's still owned by the city. Um, and I'm sure there are other facilities like that. Yeah, in the last eight years, the city could have made some arrangements to create, you know, housing spaces as well as spaces for not-for-profit agencies to provide these services that were lost to Long Island. Instead, you get situations, unfortunately, you know, a lot of human need. And Mass and Cass is the one that makes the news. But I promise you, it's not the only place and the only people. Yeah, it's just the most visible, um, probably, and the one that's garnered the most attention because of its high visibility. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. I mean, those of us, you know, who work in Boston a very long time, you know, knows what we're getting at the Kabasa Common and downtown crossing, whether it be day or nighttime. Um, you know, we're aware, for example, there's a dedicated bus line at one time that shuttled uh, folks directly uh, to uh, Long Island when the bridge was still around. And I'm mm-hmm. always like, why is the state 
uh, the MBTA paying a dedicated bus line, the Boston should be paying their own uh, bus line to their own services. The state should not be picking up those costs. Um, so, you know, I, I complain a lot about, about a Boston as a Quincy guy, although if you talk to people from Western Mass, they think I'm actually part of Boston and I have to keep telling them I'm not part of Boston. Oh, interesting. <laughs> oh, because it's a different world way West, right? True. Yeah. <laughs> they really, they, they perceive us all as like East Coast Boston people, even though we're not. Well, they wonder why they're paying for the MBTA at, at all, because it doesn't serve them. Yeah. <laughs> Precisely, right? So uh, the, for, for viewers who, who are wondering what we're talking about, it's it's the geography of the state and representing different constituencies. And, uh, you know, a lot of us in the building uh, do, do talk to each other, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, we actually try to understand the point of views of different parts of the state uh, through conversation and why they're not happy with us on the east side from the west side, right? <laughs> Uh, and it's, you know, it's part of the learning process of being the legislature and, and getting an understanding of how come they take the positions they take. Yeah, well, I, I can see it. Um, you know, they're paying for services that they're not benefiting from. So I, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And people here don't always understand why they complain. And uh, when, once you converse, you understand. So, I mean, the governor, you know, has some ability to provide, you know, some state support. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's Boston's issue. And like I said, Menino and now Marty Walsh and whomever the next mayor is, now, this problem is going to linger. And, uh, you know, it's actually a legit question to to the next mayor of Boston. You know, what is your plan uh, without Long Island available to utilize existing city resources and massive amount of property that can be developed still uh, into uh, service centers uh, within Boston, keeping people inside their own communities? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, because even, I mean, even if the Long Island Bridge someday is rebuilt, it sounds like the facilities out there are not adequate to handle this problem anymore. Yes, and the bridge construction will take many years to do. I mean, it's not a short bridge. Right. And those people, uh, particularly people who uh, live along the way of a Quincy border and Fall River, saw exactly how long it took to construct that bridge. And it was a lot of, you know, stuff that was constructed elsewhere and brought in. And there was a structural problem on one of the, the beams that uh, those pre-made that needed to be sent back a day laying construction. I mean, the renovation of the Neponset Bridge uh, took more than three years and a lot of inconvenience to people. Uh, however, the bridge is now uh, going to be fairly stable for at least 50 years. Right. So it is, a you know, trust uh, Quincy people fully grasp the inconvenience of bridge construction and the length of time. I, I promise you all of us in the city know it. Um, so, yeah, even if uh, there is movement along Ambridge and construction, it is a multi-year endeavor. Plus, you're right. They need to get uh, ways to onto the island to uh, refurbish the existing facilities to modernize them. But in interim, Boston can't wait for something that's going to be down five or ten years down the road. Right. Yeah. Though these people need help today. Right. Yeah. And it's incumbent on, them, on Boston the leadership to decide how best to handle it. Um, and then sometimes, you know, they're going to have to make that decision. You know, they do have a lot of developable property, uh, but who is it really serving? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Common question in all communities. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Folks looking at developments in many different ways, um, mm -hmm. including here in Quincy. Uh, I know that you just uh, attended the opening of a pretty major retailer for the first time in a long time here in Quincy. Yeah, Target is officially opening on the 24th. Uh, myself and uh, John Keenan, Luda Bowen, and the mayor, Coke, uh, was uh, up in uh, North Quincy yesterday uh, evening to do a ribbon cutting and a quick walk around the building. Uh, and it's a beautiful new Target. I promise I think everybody's going to enjoy this Target. Um, it does come with 200 parking spaces built into it. It's separate from the MBTA and the housing. So, and it also does provide curbside pickup. Mm. Um, as well as advanced ordering. So uh, as we live in this COVID world and enjoying this new type of amenity, um, I think people will be very happy with it. Plus, it's a Starbucks inside, you know, uh, the same type of grocery setup you see over at Braintree, um, Social Plaza Target. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, 7 a.m. opening reflects the fact that they're looking for uh, that early morning uh, traffic. So 7 to 10 every day, uh, starting the 24th of this month. Okay. And isn't there a CVS right near there as well, that same development? Uh, CVS is a part of a Target to okay. provide services. So there is a, uh, a CVS um, on, on the uh, in the building on the far side. It, I can't, it's hard to describe like this, yeah. but I mean, the, the Starbucks on the other hand is close to the, the West Squadron Street entry point. Oh, okay. Okay. 
So obviously, so people looking for their commuters, fix. yeah. Yeah, you're looking for your quick fix. They made sure the Starbucks was easy to get to. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, they have a built-in uh, uh, clientele there once the, all the apartments are completed. There's over 600 of them, I think. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because obviously the McDonald's is there, and this and the Dunkin' Donuts is way on the other side of the, of the Cathay Pacific. Yeah. So I mean, having a Starbucks located here is actually ideal because there is no true uh, coffee shop, you know, in Norfolk Downs. Hmm. Yeah, this thing's going to do really well. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah. I'm <laughs> How are you? Um, what are you hearing uh, from local businesses, Tacky, as they uh, make their way through the pandemic? Uh, things are doing all right in terms of like, you know, health and safety. Yeah. We've heard no super spreading events in, in retailers thus far. Um, a continuation is the challenge of rent, um, making rent payments, a lot of people with the rent deferrals, or they just haven't risen to a level of business uh, that, uh, you know, kept up with past rent. And of course, the work, uh, work, uh, worker shortage is very apparent. Yeah. Uh, no matter where you go, as you've seen uh, for the first time in, a very long time. Uh, employers are now doing competitive wages. Uh, I don't remember seeing competitive wages since like 1998. Mm-hmm. Uh, to give you all an idea how long it's been uh, for competitive wages. So particularly front-facing uh, jobs, healthcare industries uh, facing a lot of stress because of COVID. We know about the emotional and physical impact this had on healthcare, has on the healthcare industry and still having a lot of impact in the healthcare industry. And, uh, you know, they need to find more workers there. So as part of, you know, some of this federal money, we've got to figure out, you know, can we use some of this for a short-term uh, fix in, term, in terms of tuition reimbursements or other targeted um, skilled labors that is currently under, uh, under availability. Mm-hmm. And of course, you've got the supply chain issue. So, I mean, I'm one of those folks that if you raise your prices to pay your workers, I'm actually pretty cool with that because... Mm-hmm. I, mean, I, I do believe people need to get a living wage um, and if employers feel the need to raise the prices for the workers. I mean, I'm cool with it. Uh, like, what is it? The rising tide raises all ships? Yeah. And, and putting a more money in the hands of people keeps our money economy, uh, keeps our economy moving. So, I mean, we're a service-based economy. If you can't afford to buy uh, stuff in the, in the work, in the retail space, mm-hmm. um, whether it be, or service space, like, you know, service, like laundry services, like dry cleaning or, or going to get a rest, eat at the restaurant, the economy doesn't move. So, but you don't have enough money to do that. The economy stagnates. So, I mean, you know, it's great to see that employers are moving on wage increase on their sales, but it's, it's going to, the costs are passed on to us. Right. And then they got combined, com, uh, combined that with a supply chain problem that's causing a huge shack up in prices, especially on things like toys and, you know, flour and rice and lots of other stuff. Yeah. Um, that's actually a compounding issue uh, as opposed to uh, inflation being driven, let's say by increased workforce um, wages. You know, now you have two hitting at the same time, the ability to get stuff to the shelves uh, and, and a worker shortage and then you pay workers more. Um, it's not a good combination. No, and we're seeing, you know, the backup of cargo containers um, and some major ports around the country because of the worker shortage. And truck driver shortage. Yes, yeah. You know, as, as all economies are trying to reopen at some level, you know, and uh, we are the richest country on the planet. We have the most means of any country on the planet. And uh, we have we are the biggest consumer market in terms of uh, per capita. We, we have the highest per capita in the world. Uh, and uh, when we started reopening uh, after, you know, basically months and months and months of needing lower level of supplies other than essential goods, now uh, non-essential uh, supplies are becoming a problem to get their hands on because, you know, there was lower demand. So why'd you, why would you ask for stuff you're not selling? Mm-hmm. Right. And now that's all changed. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think we're going to live with this uh, challenge on, um, uh, certain goods and certain goods for uh, quite some time. Yeah. Do you think um, the current administration in Washington's doing a good job? We're not fighting each other about everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I know. Being being a little bit smart ass about this, uh, I think the challenge of compromise, I think, is frustrating a lot of folks, and I think the rhetoric uh, that still continues out there—it's my way, the highway on all sides—is 
it still continues to be disturbing. It's, it's a process of negotiation. And uh, we all know you start at a high number and you work your way down to a number that's reasonable. It's like what buying a house, right? Yeah. Well, exactly. It's, it's no different. I mean, it's pretty common sense, I would think, to all of us. Uh, one of the interesting components is of what Washington, D.C. is, what is the ask? Um, and I'm not sure what's actually happening. Arizona, Senator Cinema continues to baffle me. Uh, I know she's a freshman senator, but she also was a state legislator for, for, for quite a few years before she made it to the U.S. Senate. And Jelly, you just don't be immovable. Uh, you're in a position where you could be a real deal maker. And she's not asking for anything. Mm. Just it's saying just, no, period. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, no, but why? And it's challenging. At least the senator from West Virginia. Um, oh, uh, Joe Manchin. Manchin. I mean, at least he's laying down some positions that protects his own constituency. I think I respect that. I mean, people should. I mean, he represents West Virginia. It is coal country, folks. And mm-hmm. I, I, I don't want to be, you know, I know the environmentalists hate to hear that, but he's got a job to do, folks. And it's his constituency. And I, I respect that. Um, but he's also, in, you know, in a position where he can try to figure out not, uh, how to minimize the impact of his constituency uh, and, uh, you know, look at ways that um, will also help his constituency. Yeah. And every good legislator should try to figure out, you know, he can't get the whole pie. But, you know, these couple of slices that make sense um, for, for people who represent. So, I, I mean, I, I get it. But on the flip side, you got for the first time in the House, um, the liberal block actually staying together as a block. This mm-hmm. is not always the case, which is uh, making Nancy Pelosi's life a, a bit of a challenge in negotiating over there. But again, it's an immobility issue, the holding hostage, the transportation infrastructure plan in exchange for the expanded budget. And of course, again, everybody, you start in that position where you just kind of like, I want this, and then you just start working your way down to a smaller number. Right. And now there's some movement um, by, you know, that end of the caucus, whether they can hold the block together as they negotiate down um, is the question mark. Yeah, I think it's yeah two trillion now instead of three point five trillion. So it's it's a major concession. <laughs> major concession, but it's also you know what what's in that piece. Right. That right couldn't they all agree with? So I'm sure there's some persons out there like Anna Presley, for example, who staked out the immovability position, which again I don't think is is a benefit to anybody. But hmm. you know, again, not my constituency. I don't represent her constituents, so that's between her and her constituents. Yeah. Yeah. It's... And. Um, you know, and uh, trying to, you know, work something out. And of course they had to raise the debt ceiling, uh, but, but only, you know, the kick the can down the road situation. And uh, again, we've talked about this before. If you're in a minority party, regardless of whether you're a D or an R, you just basically swap positions uh, that you had the other side had adopted at one time. So it's the same playbook, different party, because mm-hmm. you're not a minority party. If the Republican party wins in 2022, uh, either branch or both branches, uh, you would see the Democrat use the same playbook. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. There's no difference. You, um, all they're doing is run, running the clock out, essentially, to use a sports analogy. Yeah. So, I mean, I love uh, hearing about people in their position of politics, but it's quickly forget that, you know, it's the same playbook, just different party using the same playbook. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it is unfortunate. It's a representative, I think, of the, the country, you know, in a wider population being so divided right now. And Biden's got to deliver. I mean, this is another a real challenge for him too. Uh, you know, obviously the global climate change. If people have been looking at this, the first big first world countries are definitely moving forward a a, a global a mm-hmm. climate plan. Really, for the first time in in many years now, not since uh, you know the Kyoto Accords, uh, the Paris Accords, and um, was it Quebec? Mm-hmm. Was one, uh, there was another one that was done in Canada. So this is actually the next big. A first world country discussion. Of course, the problem with these first world country discussions is that we're not developing nations. Right. And the nations are the ones that are actually using the most fossil fuels right now because it's the cheapest option for them to get out of, you know, basic poverty level type of countries. So, I mean, you need electricity. Electricity is the key to everything in the world. You got no electricity. You can't purify water. You can't run a sewer system. You can't do anything right. um, to bring your uh, country to look more and more like us uh, one step at a time. And, um, you know, this, this is actually one of the daunting tasks of first world countries to f- try to figure out not exactly reducing our own emissions, but how to help these countries reduce their emissions 
while at the same time moving to be more developed like Western and first world countries. Mm. So, uh, you know, this, this is something I'm hoping that, you know, the global powers that be will start having, you know, those greater discussions about that and, and how that's going to be managed. Um, you know, China, for example, has demonstrated what happens. You go cold talking too fast. I mean, uh, President C uh, pretty much runs the place. Let's be frank about it. He just runs this country by himself. Uh, essentially, makes all the decisions, uh, yeah. even more so than any democratic or, or uh, oligarchy country on the planet. Um, and uh, you know, he cut coal a lot, which is good. But now they have a power supply problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He cut coal Turkey, and then he was trying to play funny diplomacy with. Australia, who's very upset about the COVID-19 virus because uh, they've been ravaged uh, very badly uh, on that continent. Uh, and uh, you know, they thought they could hurt the Australian economy by cutting off the coal. But all that Australia did was sell the coal to a kind of other country who then sold it back to China at a markup. So now Chinese people have to pay a markup, higher markup on their energy supply in China as they're now trying to bring back coal. Because once you shut coal down, you can't just make that up in five minutes. Right. And they have a lot of renewables, but you have to move this stuff in concert. And as you bring up renewables and you're phasing off fossil fuels, you got to do it in a gradual manner to have one supply replace another. You cut cold turkey, this is what happens. And you know they're trying to, uh, they're turning off streetlights, they're going to start rationing power. It's going to get cold really fast in northern China. Electric mm-hmm. heat is very important, particularly in these multi-story buildings. Um, China is a second biggest oil, uh, oil manufacturer a, a driller in in the in the world but they're not going to be able to drill fast enough either and they're not you know oil-based systems um the natural gas uh, so you know you want an example of just not really having good planning going in on transitional uh, china's demonstrated what happens when you have uh, the second biggest economy and a major supply chain provider because they're gonna have to shut down factories you know it's gonna impact us here yeah Oh, absolutely. It's going to have to impact the global supply chain. But yeah. just, you know, factories to, to try to conserve electricity. You know, uh, and, uh, you know, this continues into warm months. The air conditioning is a big problem for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they're hyper dense because they live in the uh, majority of the population lives in, in big, 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 big cities. As you see cities greater than 20 million people. Right, right. So Everything is interconnected for sure. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's, it's uh, people always you know, look at me and I talk about this stuff in terms of transitional and no one seems to believe me when I say this. We cut cold turkey, something will happen. And Go Google up China power supply, folks. You can see what happens if you cut cold turkey. Oh, it's even in the mainstream media today, yeah. Yeah, so you need a transition. And you got to do smart transition. And uh, because otherwise really bad things will happen. Yeah. How are we doing here in Massachusetts with renewable energy? Um, I know there's... Some hydro, there's some wind, there's a little bit of solar, but um, I know there's a goal that the, the state has, but I don't know if we're close to it or not. We're, we're gradually getting there. I mean, hydro transmission line is still in the process of construction via Maine, via Maine through New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Once okay. that lines up, it gives us a second transmission line, a major transmission line from hydro Quebec. And then it would really reduce the need to utilize uh, local uh, natural gas plants as well as importing other uh, renewable or other uh, fossil fuel electricity into mm-hmm. the state. We do get both renewable and uh, fossil fuel energy from outside the state to bring in. So we have more dedicated lines of power to us in terms of wind and hydro. You know, it's less dependency of buying uh, more out of state because we need these things at a fixed cost, which is yeah. good. Uh, we will have some price stability. The drawback of price stability, if the price goes down in the general market, we pay too much, but if the price goes High in the general market, we're paying better. So that's the risk of price stability. Um, and wind takes time to build. I mean, <laughs> they have pretty big windmills and you need a lot of windmills. One windmill doesn't make a difference. Right. It really doesn't in the transmission system. So once they get into like 50 to 100, and it'll be pretty apparent when you look, see them from Block Island, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we, we'll uh, grow to that. So, I mean, you're looking really at 2025, 20, maybe 2028. You, you're going to really see this real shift in this and a renewable power source will, will continue to move uh, towards renewable and most importantly, uh, consistent renewables, especially the hydro. Okay, interesting. Curious your take on, I know you're familiar with the plan to create kind of a municipal broadband service here in Quincy. Um, Jackie, do you think that has legs to it? Well, according to the newspaper, they're looking to talk to our neighbors again, places like Weymouth and others, and we're doing collaborative 
it is it is a very expensive infrastructure project. And Seventy five really, million dollars, I think. Yeah, I think that's a little low. Okay. Uh, to be honest with you, uh, we have uh, th those have the same advantages as Braintree. Braintree is a municipal light plant. They own the poles and the, and they own all the poles. Right. And we have a pre existing infrastructure because of the electrical grid system uh, on the distribution side, the electrical grid distribution grid, where they already have a pre existing customer a customer mm -hmm. base. So they actually use. You can use the electrical distribution bill to subsidize their uh, building of their broadband as they expand customers. And since everybody in Braintree uses that municipal light plant, they already have a pre existing customer base. There's almost very little challenge on the cell. Right. Um, and as a result, they can you know use the ratepayer money to help subsidize uh, the cost, the capital cost, uh, to their cable side as the cable uh, internet money comes in, then it pays off their debt. Yep. yep. And it becomes a, uh, could be a, you know, it's a multi-year decade, more than decades of a capital cost of just stretching out. Sure. We do not have that here. So the city decides to put together a broadband, um, a business, a broadband office for that exclusive purpose. You know, the question is, is how much of our uh, bonding uh, are we going to do from the taxpayer side? And it's the mm. taxpayer that get reimbursed for that bonding from the ratepayers. Mm -hmm. I actually do know something about this, folks. I, people forget I actually worked in rate making in the AG's office representing consumers. Right. And I've been doing energy and telecom policy for a better part of 25 plus years. That's why I asked you. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's amazing uh, as we talk in the past about who they talk to. But that's besides the point. So, um, you know, this is, this is the reality, folks. I mean, they need to be able to front the money and it's going to be in the form of a bond. And they have to basically, are they going to put the rate, the incoming rate money against the bond? Mm -hmm. Why do they say you think 75 million might be a little low? It's because of the infrastructure costs of laying the wires and having to rent space on the poles okay. from the utility company. In this case, is a combination of Rise and National Grid. Right. National Grid is the um, repair, maintain of the poles, but Verizon controls some too. So uh, that's part of it. And the city, since it's the city, doesn't pay property taxes on using those little parts of the poll. So there's, mm -hmm. no, there's no real benefit there uh, to the city, obviously. Uh, and then you have to have a sell it to the customers. You have to do a massive marketing campaign. And then you need to get people to go install wires, which you probably can hire contractors to do that. But I mean, then again, you want consistency on that. And then, you know, and then you have to you know, get into people's homes, you know, put in the wires, you know, do all that stuff. And then there actually is a competitive issue coming up very quickly. Uh, you will see soon as the city uh, ordinances uh, come into full play on 5G, Verizon's entire new strategy is to cut the cord. They're going to put up a 5G. Uh, it's not The word microwave isn't accurate, but it's a shortwave um, 5G system uh, that can deliver like disgusting amount of speed. And they're, but it's a very short range. So, you know, they're going to be, the city's going to be competing uh, quickly against a 5G a microwave system from Verizon, which already exists, you know, which poles they already own. Interesting. Okay. It saves them a whole lot of time. Yeah. Regarding yeah. The installation. And uh, at some point, as Verizon builds out the 5G network on the cell phone as a whole, they're going to stop migrating. Uh, to utilize their existing infrastructure on places where there are poles um, uh, to provide these very uh, close connection to your home or your routers on, on cutting the cord. And uh, yeah, it's there's basically two types of 5G. There's, there's like the Sprint T-Mobile, AT&T 5G, and then you got the Verizon. Verizon needs more locations because they give you incredible speed, but in short distances. The other ones also give you a good speed, but it's over long distances, so it's not really as fast as the Verizon. Does that mean you should get Verizon phones? No, I'm not suggesting that, everybody. I'm just telling you that there's two different types of technology, and because of the, how they work, it's really about where you are and what your needs are. So if you're living in a community that has a lot of, of Verizon 5G, uh, you know, you may want to use that, but another community may not have a lot of Verizon 5G. You have to go back to LTE, or you have to roam against the T-Mobile Sprint service, you may not get the identical speed. So hmm. yeah, and it's still rolling it out. So our big urban areas are the priority first. Economics dictate that, so no kidding, right? Um, and of Quincy is a dense community. So at some point, you know, this city is going to get prioritized for a massive 5G expansion. People have noticed the new phones have 5G already. 
uh, but there's, there's a lot more coming, especially on the Verizon side. Yeah, it's interesting because they wouldn't come here for, to provide basic cable. It's so they obviously didn't see a market for that. Yeah, that became a, a quite a conversation. Mm. Uh, we still need a franchise agreement with the city for you to provide cable services pursuant to state law. And mm -hmm. you negotiate a deal with um, the city and part of that includes some level of community service. Now, you know, I can't speak for uh, past administrations because, you know, a lot of the files rolled out was prior to Mayor Coke, actually. Right. Yeah. In, the, in the early onset of their uh, wired based uh, internet and cable. So I can't speak to pre Coke administration on that yeah. because they stopped expansion uh, prior to the mayor's election. Um, but I mean, you know, if, if the city could have uh, pursued uh, files uh, prior uh, to them. Uh, you know, shutting off that service in favor of moving forward in 5G technology. I know it sounds like many years, but I mean, they, Verizon had a clear vision of the future and uh, cable infrastructure is so costly and so expensive. And then now we're moving to streaming services and the paying, uh, paying um, uh, providers for content is not cheap. Right. Yeah. So ESPN has Monday Night Football. They charge you premium dollars for you to have ESPN. And that cost is passed on to you. So, you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a little bit of a somewhat of a hostage situation on content. But with streaming services changing the whole dynamic of how you get entertainment um, and with high end 5G, those who've been using 5G on your phone to watch things, you know, in you know, downtown Quincy, for example, you know, we can see the, the depth of the quality associated with it. That's actually uh, can be cheaper and faster uh, than uh, wired cable and you know, now you have hotspot capacity on many phones that give you unlimited or limited amount of data for you to do so that you can stream onto a laptop or, a, or another tablet or larger device. Um, and if you got enough bandwidth on your routers, you could, you know, theoretically run a lot of um, data through your phone as a hotspot as 5G technology uh, continues expanding the bandwidth is expanding as well. So, you know, uh, cable companies are moving away from wired over time mm -hmm. and you see that with comcast as well as people got their advertising were buying comcast cell phones yes that's right yep and uh i'm aware in cities like atlanta and others have been piling in for many years uh big cable companies are piling for many years now about using their existing uh infrastructure broadband to go completely wireless as well and uh, that uh will be big community small community they've been piling this thing for many years to try to get the kinks out of technology so Quincy providing wire-based broadband it will be an interesting challenge in the competitive marketplace where everybody already has a cell phone and the idea of having a singleized package of, of a cell phone service with high speed where they can provide you uh, some content like people getting uh, Amazon Prime or, 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 or uh, HBO or, or Netflix or Hulu as part of the package. And then you're know, providing you unlimited data or high amount of data. Um, and uh, hotspot capacity. I mean, I can see people buying or renting, um, or maybe not actually have to buy or rent a box. I mean, they can mm -hmm. uh, get a router, uh, or right, actually probably need to have a have a box because of security purposes. So they're probably going to need you know some kind of small box so that they can uh, hook your uh, 5G router. You have 5G routers. You've been having a 5G router probably if you bought one in the last five to ten years. You have a right. 5G. Right. You just need the service to go with it. Yeah. You know, probably just have a connected box, to the Ethernet. That yep. connects it to the 5G and then, you know, off you go, or they probably maybe have a security system where you can connect your router directly to the, to the 5G wireless outside your house and then retransmit to, your, I'm sure it's easy to figure out. I just don't know what it looks like exactly, but there's right. a few ways to tell us to make it happen. So the city is actually going to be looking to do direct competition late in the game, building a full infrastructure, not against wired internet. They're going to compete against wireless internet. Hmm. I have to see if, um, yeah, they're, they're not behind the eight ball already before they start, you yeah. know. Well, I mean, I don't know. I have not seen the business plan, and I, I don't know. I just pay a lot of attention to this industry. It's kind of my job. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> Speaking of uh, your job, how do folks get a hold of you, Tacky, to, to have them uh, do your job? 617-722-2014, 617-722-2014, slap a button, you can find us. Uh, of course, you can reach us at uh, my email, tacky.chan at mahouse.gov, T-A-C-K-E-Y dot C-H-A-N at mahouse.gov. 
Uh, I am drowning in testimony, but I will be filtering my emails out. And I do check my junk mail folder because stuff happens to go there. But to get your constituent concerns, um, for example, we've had concerns about some city issues regarding, again, as we call potholes and tree trimming, right? Um, it's that time of year we had a lot of those uh, issues as well as unemployment, housing issues, and sometimes just helping them direct people to find information. You'd be surprised if people would just call us to like, where do I call? Mm -hmm. And we can mm -hmm. in that sense. And um, if you need mail in voting ballot, don't forget to do that. Uh, that's coming up quick. But you also can check my uh, Facebook at State Representative Tacky Chan if you want to see me in my next public hearing executive session. You know, we'll be posting it up there as well as uh, places I've been and uh, some useful information as we get it from the state. You know, we'll, we'll put up the graphic. Uh, we like we discover people like graphics uh, <laughs> rather than me writing like a paragraph. Yeah, well, they're just easier to look at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Facebook tells us what people like. Graphics are easily <laughs> the thing people like according to Facebook. People like pictures. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, obviously, I have my website, tackingchin.org, uh, which uh, provides some, again, some referral numbers and things like that that can uh, help you find stuff before you actually have to call us directly. So okay. uh, we are very, very busy right now to let you all know, uh, both on the uh, constituent service level, the legislative schedule, and of course, as a committee chair. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff I'm trying to juggle right now. All right. Well, we will catch up uh, next week if that's okay. No, uh, absolutely. I'll see you in a week's time. And mean, meanwhile, be safe, be well, and, and please enjoy the weather. Absolutely. Thanks, Tacky. You too. Mm -hmm.